Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing NVIDIA stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. NVIDIA designs GPUs, graphics processing units, for the gaming and professional markets. NVIDIA, AMD, and Qualcomm are fabless, meaning they outsource chip manufacturing. Taiwan Semiconductor is the largest foundry in the world. Foundry means it manufactures chips for other companies like this one. NVIDIA designs chip units for the mobile computing and automotive market. Its product Tegra is used for smartphones, tablets, vehicle navigation, and entertainment systems. Its primary GPU line called GE Force is in direct competition with the GPUs of the Radeon brand by Advanced Micro Devices. The company expanded its presence in the gaming industry with its handheld game consoles, Shield Portable, Shield Tablet, and Shield Android TV. NVIDIA provides parallel processing capabilities to researchers and scientists that allow them to efficiently run high performance applications. It is also now focused on artificial intelligence. The company is headquartered in Santa Clara, California and was founded in 1993. The stock trades on the NASDAQ, Deutsche Börse, Mexican Bolsa, Zitra, Vienna, Euro TLX, Swiss, Sao Paulo, Buenos Aires, Bulgaria, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and Lima Stock Exchange. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 580 billion market cap. They're trading at 234 share and they have 2.5 billion shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So you can see they have tons of free cash flow and it grows a lot from 3 billion way up to 7 billion. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses, and that doubles from 4.1 billion to 8.2 billion. Revenue is a sales for the company, and that also doubles from 12 billion to 24 billion. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. Cost of labor is a big cost of revenue for this company. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit and that more than doubled from 7 billion to 15 billion. Below that is their operating expenses. Research and development is a big operating expense for this company. And below that is their operating income, which more than doubled from 3.8 billion to 8.6 billion. It looks like they're adding debt. They paid 58 million of interest on their debt in 2019. It's up to 228 million. Below that is other income and expenses. These are all the gains or losses not part of the company's core operations. An example of something in this category is the gain on the sale of an asset or business unit. Below that is their pre-tax income, then their taxes, and the bottom line of the income statement is their net income which is the highest ever in a trailing 12 months at over $8 billion. This is the company's income statement from their latest quarterly report. This shows us the nine months ending October 2020 and October 2021. And this shows us the three months ending October 2020 and October 2021. So their revenue grew from 4.7 billion to 7 billion. That's 7 billion of revenue in a three month period. The country with the most revenue is Taiwan at 2.2 billion, then China at 2 billion. All other countries in Asia Pacific is 1 billion. US is 1.1 billion. Europe is 340 million and all the other countries 366 million. Every country saw an increase in revenue. Their gaming revenue is their bread and butter. That's 3.2 billion up from 2.3 billion. Data centers is 2.9 billion. Professional visualization is 577 million. Automotive 135 million. Original equipment manufacturer is 234 million. The direct cost to generate the 7.1 billion is 2.5 billion. So their gross profit is 4.6 billion up from 3 billion. Their gross margin is 65%. That's gross profit over revenue. The average of the 68 companies in their industry is 44%. The median is 48%. Research and development is 1.4 billion. SGNA is 557 million. So their operating expenses are 2 billion. 
Their operating income is 2.7 billion, up from 1.4 billion. They spent 62 million of interest on their debt. Last year was 53 million. So their net income was 2.5 billion. Last year was 1.3 billion. Their net margins are 35%. That's net profit over revenue. Anything over 20% is considered amazing. The average in their industry is negative 2%. The median is 10%. So they're doing much better in gross margin and net margin than their industry. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. So you could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash because net income is your accounting profit or loss. It's not actual cash. So their cash flow grew a ton from 3.7 billion to over 8 billion. This is the cash that's remaining after all your day-to-day -day expenses. And they don't have that much in CapEx because they're fabless. They don't do the semiconductor manufacturing. They outsource that to companies like Taiwan Semiconductor. Their CapEx was only 1 billion in the trailing 12 months. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. They do pay a small dividend, really small. And it looks like they bought back some common stock in 2019, 1.6 billion. But they keep the profits in-house to grow the business, either organically or through acquisition. This is their operating cash flows from their statement of cash flows. This is directly from their latest quarterly report. And this is the nine months ending October 2020 and October 2021. And a way to calculate operating cash flow, you start with your net income that was 6.7 billion. Then we have to add back some non-cash items, one and a half billion of stock-based compensation. This is when you pay employees with stock. Since this is a non-cash item for the company, we add it back here. We add back depreciation and amortization, 865 million. We minus deferred income taxes of 182 million. Deferred income taxes are taxes the company will eventually pay, but are not due yet. Deferred income taxes is a difference between the way GAAP calculates taxes and the IRS calculates taxes. We also have to adjust for changes in working capital. It looks like they extended 1.5 billion of credit. So they sold items on credit, but they didn't receive cash. So that's a cash outflow of 1.5 billion. But when those customers pay for the item, it'll be a cash inflow in that accounting period. They also spent $400 million on inventory. That's a cash outflow. Even though they reported an accounting profit of 6.7 billion, they only generated 6.1 billion of cash flow. Last year was accounting profit of 2.9 billion and they generated more cash flow, 3.8 billion. This is the investing and financing sections on the statement of cash flows, the nine months ending October 2020 and the nine months ending October 2021. In 2020, they spent over 8 billion on acquisitions. But the reason they have so much cash outflow was this purchase of marketable securities. So instead of keeping cash on your balance sheet, companies invest in short-term investments like treasury bonds or commercial paper. That's a lot of investments, 16 billion. So they keep a lot of cash on their balance sheet. In their investing section, they had a cash outflow of 8 billion. Last year was a cash outflow of 16 billion. In their financing section, they added 5 billion of debt. They paid 1.3 billion of taxes on employee restricted stock units. They paid down 1 billion of debt. They paid 298 million of dividends. So in their financing section, they had a cash inflow of 2.6 billion. Last year was a cash inflow of 4 billion. This is the equity section on their 1031 balance sheet. They have 24 billion of equity. They raised 10 billion from selling their business. They profited 25 billion from running their business. They bought back 12 billion of common stock. That brings down their equity balance by 12 billion. So historically, they're a really profitable company. Let's look at the capital structure. 24 billion of equity, 12 billion of debt. They're 67% equity, 33% debt. And don't just look how much debt a company has. Look at their net debt. They could pay off all the debt with the cash on their balance sheet and still have over 7 billion of cash left over. So when you see this, it's pretty much like they have no debt. And I gave them the lowest whack of 6.79% and that's a discount rate we're gonna apply to the future cash flows. We estimated a few years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year 2024. That's 358 billion. 
We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $326 billion. We divide that by 2.5 billion shares. And we get a calculated stock price of 131. They're trading at 234, so they're trading at a 78% premium. It's a sell according to the model. Their revenue is projected to grow 16.6%. I increased that to 25%. So I grew their revenue 25% for the next few years. That's how I got their future revenue estimates. To get their future free cash flows, I need to see what percent of their revenue they convert to free cash flow. So I summed up these four free cash flow numbers and I divided by the sum of these four revenue numbers. And that comes out to 30%. So they convert 30% of their revenue to free cash flow. I multiplied their future revenue estimates by 30%. That's how I got their future free cash flows. But I'm still coming out of the stock price a lot lower than the trading at. The website Simply Wall Street values the company at 241. They're saying it's 3% undervalued. 25 analysts priced this stock and the average price target is 359. The low is 285, the high is 400. This is where the stock has been trading the last two years. So you can see it kept going up and up and up and up. But it has regressed the past few months. A lot of stocks have been coming down. So it looks like it could be a great time to buy it. But I think there's a good chance it's going to keep coming down. I think the floor will be 180. That's just my guess. They have a beta of 1.31. So the stock is a little more volatile than the market. It's up 71% in the past 52 weeks while the S&P is up 14%. The 52 week low is 115. The high is 346. And the stock is trading between its 50 day and 200 day moving average. This is a really popular stock. Nearly 50 million shares are traded each day. Of the 2.5 billion shares outstanding, 2.4 billion are on float. Two thirds are held by institutions and 1% of the shares are shorted. They pay a tiny dividend of 4 cents. That's only 7 basis points. 5% of their net income, 6% of their free cash flow. Their employee count goes up every year. They currently employ 19,000 people. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, you'd have $680,000 today. That's a 52% annual return. In the past year, there's been only insider selling, no buying. Here are the insiders that have sold the dates the number of shares, and the price they sold at. 66% of the company is held by institutions, 30% by the general public, and 4% by insiders. The biggest shareholder is Vanguard at 8%, 195 million shares, valued at $46 billion, then BlackRock, Fidelity, and State Street. The CEO owns 3.4% of the company, which is worth nearly $20 billion. Let's look at their financial ratios. They have a really high price earnings of 71. That's stock price over earnings per share. They also have a high price to sales of 24 and a high price to book of 25. Let's look at their non-current assets. 2.5 billion of property and equipment. 800 million of operating leases. 4.3 billion of goodwill. Goodwill is the premium you pay when you acquire another company. Two and a half billion of other intangibles, one billion of deferred income taxes, and 3.8 billion of other. They have an amazing ROIC of 42%. They can cover their interest payments 38 times. They have a really high ROE of 35%. The median is 7%, the average is 2%. They can cover their current liabilities with their current assets seven times. Their quick ratio 6.5. Quick ratio excludes inventory from current assets. Let's look at their current assets. 1.3 billion of cash, 18 billion of marketable securities. Marketable securities is considered cash. 4 billion of accounts receivables. This is how much other companies owe NVIDIA. 2.2 billion of inventory and 300 million of prepaid expenses. Let's look at their current liabilities. 1.7 billion of accounts payable. This is how much Nvidia owes other companies and 1.9 billion of accrued liabilities. In the trailing 12 months, they had over 7 billion of free cash flow and they have 22 billion of working capital. Working capital is current assets minus current liabilities. They pay out 400 million of dividend payments 
They have nearly 29 billion of funding, so the company is really well funded. The best way to look at ratio is to compare them to companies in the same industry. There are 68 companies in the same industry as NVIDIA, and these are the 20 biggest in their industry. NVIDIA spends a little less than average in CapEx. Since they're fabless, they don't need to spend as much in CapEx as a company like Taiwan Semiconductor. Intel and Micron design and manufacture their own semiconductor chips. Their debt to equity ratio is average. They pay a tiny dividend. They generate a lot more free cash flows than the average company. Their market cap is second highest to Taiwan Semiconductor. They were over 700 billion a few months ago, but the stock has come down. All their price multiples are much worse than the average company in the industry. They generate lots of revenue, four times the average. And the reason people are buying the stock and pushing the price higher is because look at their annual growth rate. 32% five-year annual revenue growth rate. That's pretty impressive, highest on this list. And they have a really high ROA. ROA is net income over assets, 24% and they have a really high ROE of 34%. ROE is net income over equity. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 78% premium, and this has been one of the fastest growing companies the past decade. And this company, along with a few others, are the reason the markets are going up so much, because massive companies like this drag up the averages. Tesla and Apple are also in the same category as Nvidia. They're so huge they make up so much of the market. So this is a great long-term hold, but I think in a short term, I could see some downside, but I'm kicking myself for not investing in this stock earlier. But of course, none of us can predict the future. We just try to use as much information we have to try to gauge the future. So I think this stock will come down a bit more, but if you're holding the stock for 10, 15, 20 years, it doesn't matter if you buy it now or you buy it in a few months. There's plenty of future growth with this company, especially a company in the semiconductor industry. It's such a hot market right now. I rank their free cash flows 10 out of 10, their revenue 10 out of 10, and their ratios 2 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.